Hello, and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. Today we have the launch of the Illinoides shuttle on ETS-6, carrying Crew Node 2 to Hoffman Station. This node has quarters for four additional station crew members, as well as docking for more GBN space planes. The ports on this node are spread out, spaced better than they were on Crew Node 1, so hopefully the GBs will have more clearance. Rossi Kerman is the commander on this mission. She was the backup pilot on ETS-4. There are two rookies on this mission, engineer Al Bart and scientist Bart Dan. The backup pilot is Valentina Kerman, who was commander on ETS-1 and ETS-2. Here we go on the count. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, main engine start, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. We have liftoff of ETS-6 to Hoffman Station carrying crew node 2. The shuttle seems to have its balance and Rossi Kerman will begin the roll here. Looks to be a nice smooth roll maneuver for Rossi Kerman's first stint as commander of the mission. The EDB is currently working on modifications both to the external tank as well as to the shuttle. For the external tank, the idea is to put docking ports on either end, instead of just having the external tank return into the atmosphere, having the external tank remain in orbit and potentially be reused in orbit uh, for some other purpose for carrying fuel and such. And so that possibility is being explored. For the shuttle itself, uh, the EDB is looking into the possibility of a Block 3 shuttle. The block 1 was of course the Garuda, as we see here. Uh, Rossi Kerman has the OMS engines lit and we will have booster separation. And boosters are out. Booster is separating. Okay, boosters are clear of the shuttle. And they did not collide with each other, so they will be recovered so that those funds can be returned to the agency. As I was saying, the Garuda was the first variant of the shuttle for version 1.0.2. This is the Illinoides shuttle, which is for 1.0.4. The next variant is currently unnamed, but it would have two additional Werner thrusters in the wheel well, uh, which is the space that also has the connection to the external tank, and those Werner thrusters will be shielded by that well and also be able to assist the shuttle in maneuvering, because the shuttle lacks downward-facing thrusters at this point. Another planned improvement is to docking port assembly in the shuttle bay, which is the shuttle's way of docking to the station in the future. And it's currently quite bulky. The modification is based on the design from Das Valdez on Twitch. And the new design would actually have habitation for four additional Kerbals, as well as a viewport into the shuttle's cargo bay. So these are seen as critical improvements to the current design. Other improvements will be more aesthetic, cleaning up some of the lines and adjusting the position of the Werner thrusters a bit, moving the wings slightly so they line up better. Uh, very subtle differences planned for the next variant of the shuttle. Here the shuttle is approaching its target apoapsis, which is the apoapsis of the station. Its periapsis will be kept low so that it can phase with the station and catch up with the station. And so here we see engine shutdown as the target apoapsis is reached. And you'll note that the external tank still has fuel. So if some thrusters could be added to the external tank, it could separately reach orbit. And if it had a controller and docking ports, it could be used uh, at a later date. And so that is the plan for the external tank modification. Here the shuttle alone makes orbit after unlocking its own fuel tanks. And then we see a very low periapsis being targeted around 75 kilometers. Unfortunately, the payload manager failed to lock the mop propellant tanks on the payload once again. And so that was done once in orbit. However, some of the mop propellant was lost. It was not refueled as it was in the previous shuttle mission. This time, the payload had more than enough mop propellant to suffice. Here, the shuttle is making its first burn to approach the station. Now that was a flaw of mission planning as well. It took a much longer time to rendezvous with the station than normal. 
But at long last, uh, Rusty Kerman and her crew brought the shuttle to within 350 meters of the station, again drifting away from the station uh, to make sure that there is no incident. And here the payload is released, that is crew node 2. And the payload, as usual, has its own controller and its own ability to dock up with the station, and that is what is going to happen here. There is a bit of a design flaw with these crew nodes in that four GBs really can't dock on them. Of course, it has room for four crew members, and ideally you'd want those crew members to arrive on their own GBs and dock up, but really there isn't enough clearance for four GBs to dock with this at the same time. The limiting factor here is actually the size of the shuttle's cargo bay, which wouldn't allow the docking ports to be spread out further in order to give the necessary clearance for the GBs in that direction. The, this crew node does have better clearance with respect to the rest of the station, as we see here a great view of the crew node approaching the station with the shuttle in the background. The crew node approached low. Of course, the station now is uh, never turned to accommodate the approach of the new modules. It is simply static and so the modules have to do all the docking work. And here you see it as it comes in low, now lining up with the docking port and drifting towards it now under 30 meters. From some views you can see how big the GB is compared to the station and imagine the docking of the Orion 1 space plane with the station that is enormous by comparison as well. So the station really has a lot of expanding to do before it can accommodate these larger vessels. Uh, here crew node 2 is lined up with the docking port though a little bit of skew in its orientation around this rotational axis. It seems to be alright here I should mention ahead of time, please do not send any mail about SAS being on. Uh, the, the EDB and Jeb are well aware of this situation. And in this case, docking was not quite acceptable. Jeb decided that it was a little bit too askew for future planning for the station. Of course, we want the ports to be very much in line. We wouldn't want GBs sort of tilted on the station. And so Jeb decides to undock it and redock it. Speaking of future planning for the station, of course, there are more solar arrays to be sent up. Right now, just the I-1 and I-2 trusses are on. There is also the M-1 and M-2 and O-1 and O-2. And so uh, we expect further expansion in that area as we see this docking back up again. And also there's further extensions of the Orion docking arms. The next shuttle mission is planned to carry the rest of the left docking arm, which has three more segments, and then there will also be the right docking arm with three more segments on another mission. And then after that, uh, fuel containers to supply the Orion space plane and other, other craft will have to be attached to the station, and those are expected on the opposite side of the Orion docking area. So, quite a lot of expansion planned for Hoffman Station, and as we see its current state here, we look forward to seeing it in even grander form in the near future. But now, let us turn back to the shuttle and its return to the KSC. By the time Crew Node 2 had finished docking with Hoffman Station, the Illinois shuttle had already drifted out of the safety area and was preparing to make the burns to put itself into its standby orbit of 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, as you see here. Rusty Kerman completing the necessary burns here, except for the extremely long delay in rendezvousing with the station. Everything was going by the book as they proceeded on with the descent burn, and that brought the periapsis to under 26 kilometers, which is standard. At this point, the operations for descent for the shuttle are fairly, fairly uh, solid. You'll note that while the Kerbals were extremely anxious on the way up during launch, uh, they are exceptionally jubilant on the way down because this is considered a rather safe portion of the journey. And there's really nothing better for a Kerbal than feeling essentially safe while being enveloped in flames on descent. Uh, that is uh, the height of Kerbal experience. 
here we see that the shuttle was falling a bit short and so had to pitch down in order to gain some lift to return safely to KSC. No big problem here. The shuttle is more than capable of bearing through this level of heating and more. And in fact, it, it has more overheating on ascent than it seems to on descent. On approach to the home continent's western coast, the shuttle began to actually gain altitude and so that was a little bit of a problem and so once again the shuttle had to increase pitch in order to increase drag to avoid that. It managed to get beyond 37 kilometers in altitude before finally coming back down here so a much steeper descent than, than would be advisable though the Kerbal's completely unfazed, Rosty quite jubilant still. And Standard switch to air breathing mode on descent. At this point, Rossi Kerman brought the shuttle's nose down in line with the prograde vector at around 27 kilometers in altitude. And this is when the incident occurred. A sudden wing crack and strike took at least two of the shuttle's wing parts. And this caused greater concern for the shuttle. It was still considered flight worthy, though unbalanced and whether it could make a safe landing or would have to ditch somewhere other than the runway was uncertain. The Kraken was not done though as another wing piece was lost and that piece had an adjoining piece that fell away and now the control situation was very dire and uh, all, all but Bart Dan Kerman uh, were quite nervous in the crew at this point. I'm not too sure why scientist Bart Dan was still excited. The balance issues were quite severe and so Rusty Kerman lit the rapiers in their air breathing mode and tried to regain control. However, the rear tank had not been unlocked and so soon we'll see here the... Oh, the, there goes another wing piece. Uh, somewhat balancing out the wings of the shuttle so maybe that that crack and strike was probably for the best but here Rosti begins to get control but uh, fuel is going to run out and she will have to unlock the remaining tank and there we go um, protocol is to unlock all the tanks uh, on the way to orbit after the external tank is separated and so this was a failure of operations uh, one of many failures uh, planning on rendezvous was a failure as well as the payload management was a failure and so uh, but of course none of those failures justifies these Kraken strikes Rusty Kerman tried to turn the craft to the left side uh, initially but the shuttle actually wanted to tend to the right and so that is the way she ultimately chose to line up with the runway, turning right and then flattening out, going for a bit and then continuing on. At this point she reported decent control, but it was still a tense situation. Fortunately the vertical stabilizers were not lost at any point. Uh, the loss of those would create severe instability in this shuttle design. Here Rossi is turning for final approach and the Kraken is not done yet. Uh, there another piece, not clear what piece that was, but certainly uh, and then uh, actually evening out the wings. The Kraken struck again. Not entirely sure what the intent of this Kraken is or its providence. There will have to be much Kraken research uh, following this incident. Certainly the EDB would like to avoid future incidents with wing Kraken strikes in particular. Other Kraken of uh, various sorts have not plagued the shuttle program thus far. This is a unique situation. Uh, wing Kraken of course particularly severe for the shuttle, not so important for pod based programs. Here Rosti seems to have the shuttle under control though a little bit to the left of the runway. Approaching now 100 meters 
still very left. Thankfully still has those vertical stabilizers to yaw a bit and that was essential in getting the craft to the runway. And touchdown, touchdown, a fairly high speed for this shuttle but it does have the extra speed brakes as well as the parachute to deploy for extra drag and there we have that. However the Kraken was not done yet, oh no. It was infuriated that Rosti had succeeded despite its efforts and therefore chose to freeze physics entirely and then reset physics to an earlier time. The Illinois shuttle found itself back in its 100 by 100 standby orbit with the crew completely unaware of what had just happened. However, the EDB does have Kraken proof recorders on board the shuttle and that is how we know what had happened and the, the time lapse, if you will. And so the shuttle had to be brought back down again and uh, Mission Control was also unaware of what had just happened until after recovering the data recorders. And so there was no concern in Mission Control about whether the wing Kraken would strike again, nor any concern among the Kerbal crew. And so we see here, once again down to the descent orbit, and once again the crew excited as the shuttle descended into the atmosphere and approached the KSC. Most of the details of the approach were exactly similar, including the fact that the shuttle fell a bit short initially and had to nose down, had to pitch down in order to gain some lift. Flame effects were nominal, as were the smiles on the faces of the Kerbinauts as they re-entered and approached the west coast of the home continent. And here was the situation as the shuttle approached the same point where the Kraken struck in the previous iteration. Here we see Rosti turning towards the runway as well as pitching down at around 27 kilometers as before, though not quite as decisively pitching down as she did in the previous iteration. And still some concern among the crew and still absolutely no concern by Bartdine Kerman, the scientist, who seems to have utter confidence in his commander. And that is probably justified given the success Rosti had after the wing failure after the Kraken strike. Here there was no Kraken strike, as you can see the wing completely intact as Rosti brought the shuttle closer and closer to the runway. And here descending to 600 meters. 500 meters, 400 meters, 300 meters, 200, 100, air brakes consistently out this time, 20, 10, touchdown, touchdown of the Illinois shuttle after ETS 6. Uh, hopefully the Kraken has decided to go home and the drag chute is out. No indication that time will suddenly stand still this time. It seems like the Kraken has had its fun and Rusty Kerman has once again brought the shuttle back home safely. And of course with the Kraken safe recorder we can give Rossi her due for, for bravery and excellence in the face of the disaster that was nevertheless cancelled out from the actual uh, flow of time. Please do not write to the EDB about any paradoxes that might result from this. Otherwise, your comments and suggestions are welcome in the comment section below. We hope you enjoyed watching this presentation of ETS-6 from the EDB and if you did so, please do press like and we hope you'll join us for future missions. And with that, this is the EDB signing off.